So your sled won't start, or it sounds like it wants to stall every time you give it throttle. And it smells like gas. Well, more than it usually smells like gas. Well, it's probably flooded. So why does it keep flooding? Are you doing something wrong? Is there something wrong with the sled? Let's break it down. Hey there, snowmobilers. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is David Clark, and today's video is about flooding. The whole reason I created the channel is that a simple problem like flooding your sled can really seem like a big deal. More experienced riders can forget just how upsetting this can be. I just bought a sled 10 minutes ago. This thing was running great. Now I'm out on the trail and it won't even start. Well, that's it. I'm going to die out here. Well, calm down. It's just flooded. So today's video is the first in a series of videos I'm going to do about carburetors and combustion. By the end of the video, you're going to have a good understanding of why sleds flood, what makes a chronically flooding snowmobile, and some of the things that you can do to prevent flooding in your sled. So flooding a snowmobile is something that's going to happen, particularly if your snowmobile has a carburetor. Fuel injected sleds can flood too, but it's not as common. You've probably got some idea of what flooding is, right? It's like, well, there's like too much gas in there. I want to talk about flooding in a little bit more detail. If you want to figure out why things are going wrong, you need to understand how they're supposed to work. So for a sled to run, it needs three things. A properly proportioned mixture of gas and air, sufficient compression to compress that fuel charge to a density that can be easily ignited, and a properly timed spark. In order to achieve the most effective combustion, or combustion that converts most of the gasoline in that cylinder to its exhaust gases, hydrocarbons, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, you need the right ratio of fuel to air. In order to achieve the most effective combustion in your snowmobile, you need a ratio of about 14.7 to 1, or 14.7 parts of air to one part of fuel. And that's by weight, not by volume. That's important, we'll get back to that. So unless you got a fuel injected sled, delivering that fuel at the right ratio is the job of the carburetor. A modern fuel injected sled can do that infinitely better. It can adjust and deliver that mixture much more precisely. The engine control module, or ECM, is connected to a bunch of sensors in the sled that tell it things like manifold pressure, and throttle position, or crankshaft position. Even the temperature of exhaust gas. And then it uses that input to control things like how long your injectors stay open. But carbureted sleds like my 97 rely on a simple mechanical carburetor. So that 97 has two VM40 or 40 millimeter Makuni carburetors. This one is pretty much the same thing. It's a little bit smaller. In this video, we're going to talk about a specific part of this carburetor as it relates to flooding. Okay, back to our fuel air mixture. So if that ratio is out of whack, then your sled won't run right. So if you have too much air, so say 17 to 1, then your sled is running lean. If you have too much gas relative to air, say 12 to 1, then your sled is running rich. So if the mixture is rich, there's some clues. You'll get throttle hesitation. You'll get wasted fuel in the exhaust. Uh, it'll tend to bog or hesitate when it comes off of idle. So when you give it throttle, it'll start to bog. So there's a whole range between lean and rich where the sled runs poorly and that ideal spot right in the middle. But there's also a point where the sled won't run at all. That's called the flammability limit. The flammability limit basically describes the minimum and maximum percentage of fuel in a mixture that you can ignite with a spark. If you have less than 1.4% gas in your mixture, it won't burn. And the upper limit is 7.6%. So if you enrich that mixture enough that you're past that 7.6% of gasoline, you've exceeded the upper flammability limit. You're just dumping gas in there that can't burn, the spark plugs get wet, and it's flooded. All right, so you can't get your sled started. How do you know the problem is flooding? Well, there's a bunch of little telltales. Well, first off, you're gonna smell gas, right? You've got gas going in the cylinder. It's either not being burned properly or not at all. You're gonna smell gas. You may have gas coming out of the exhaust. Another clue that it might be flooded is what was it doing before you shut it down, right? So remember that a rich mixture hesitates when it comes off idle or as you give it throttle, right? So, and I used to do this with my sled. If you make that mixture too rich and then you're out riding and you give it throttle and it seems like it wants to stall or it's hesitating and you either shut it down or it does stall, that's another clue that it's flooded. Okay, the other thing you can do to confirm that you're flooded is pull the spark plugs and have a look, right? So you should have a toolkit on the sled. If you don't now, then go and get one. But just pull the spark plugs, have a look. They shouldn't be wet. If your spark plugs are wet and you smell gas, it's probably flooded. Okay, so we know what flooding is. We know how to determine that our problem is flooding. Why is it flooding? So a few reasons for that. First off, it could be something you did. You just haven't figured out how to start your sled yet. So the one thing you need to remember is a internal combustion engine needs a richer mixture to start when it's cold. A couple of reasons for that. One, the vaporization point of gasoline is different at a lower temperature. Uh, but the other big reason is that cold air is more dense than warm air. So remember we said that the 14.7 to 1 is by weight, not volume. 
So there you go. At a lower temperature, there's actually more air in the same unit of volume. So your mixture is actually a little bit lean. So choke enriches your mixture for starting. Now in the case of this ATV, it's not a true choke. It actually, what it does is it moves a little piston that allows additional fuel into the carburetor, but it does the same thing. So if you've got a rich condition on your ATV, that type of choke is particularly prone to sticking. But on most sleds, you can have a butterfly valve that restricts the airflow into the carburetor. If you have a choke on your sled, that's one reason a new sled owner will tend to flood their sled. So yeah, this ATV was a little bit of a pain when I first got it. So it's air cooled. It does have an oil cooler, but it doesn't have a thermostat. So it takes forever to warm up and it's got a manual choke. So when I come out, it's really cold. I pull the choke up, it enriches that mixture so I can start it. If I over choke it, so if I leave the choke up too long, or if I use the choke when it's already warm, I can enrich that mixture too much and end up flooding it. So now I can tell when it's warm enough and I turn the choke off, but I stalled it out a few times when I first got it. But a much bigger culprit is these guys. So this is a primer. So if you're new to snowmobiles and you're likely to flood your sled with a choke, you're almost guaranteed to flood it with a primer. So a primer is just a simple pump and it enriches the mixture by squirting a little bit of gas straight into the airstream as it passes through the carburetor. The reason people get in trouble with a primer is if the primer lines are empty, the first four or five pumps are just air because you have to draw fuel up and send it back down to the carburetor. So what ends up happening is people pump that primer too many times and they flood the sled. So once the primer lines are full, it's two to three shots on the primer to start the sled. So my suggestion until you get the hang of it, open the hood and watch the fuel line. Then you know when that fuel has reached the carburetor, then you give it your two or three shots and you're good. So you definitely want to be careful about overusing the primer. I remember stopping at a gas station and seeing an older fella pumping away on his primer. <laughs> that sounded kind of dirty. So I did stop. I did explain it seemed like he was priming it a little bit too much. He just bought that sled and what he thought was he was pumping it up to build a little bit of pressure in the fuel system. So that's not what your primer is for. So once those primer lines are full, it's two or three shots and that's it. Okay, the other mistake that I made with my primer was priming the sled when it didn't need to be primed. In other words, when it was already warm. So I'd get the sled started, I'd go out for a ride, I'd find a nice spot, pull over, shut it down and take in the scenery for 10 or 15 minutes. Well, now I got the hang of my primer, so I'm just priming all over the place. I'm gonna go, so I prime my sled. It's already warm, so now I've flooded it. All right, but don't stress about it. I promise you in a couple of weeks, you'll get the hang of starting your sled and that won't happen to you anymore. Now, other times it's not something you're doing. Your sled will say, sorry, honey, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> it's always you. All right, so if it's nothing that you're doing that's leading to an overly rich condition and flooding, then there's something wrong with the sled. Now, when you start to problem solve, you're tempted to think about that in terms of too much gas, but you need to think about it in terms of a ratio that's swung in favor of too much gas, and it's not the same thing. Because if you reduce the amount of air in that mixture, you now have a ratio that favors gas. So when you're problem solving before you even get to the carburetor, look for things that'll affect airflow. So a really dirty air filter or a blocked air box will have the same effect as a stuck choke. Okay, now we can start having a look at this carburetor. Um, I'm gonna, just gonna begin by taking this slide valve to get the throttle cable out of our way. There's two things we wanna look at. Now, the first one is this air screw. Now I'm gonna talk about that more in another video. Typically that's not the reason that you have a flooding problem, but it does control the amount of air that gets into the idle circuit. So if it's not turned out enough, you don't have enough air, you end up with a rich condition. But if you've got a chronically flooding engine, the problem is much more likely to be down here. This is actually called the float chamber. A lot of guys will just call this the bowl. So fuel enters this carburetor through the main fuel line. There's a couple of ways it gets there. So some sleds will just have a gravity feed system. So if the tank is high enough above the carburetors, then gravity is enough to get it there. Other sleds like both of mine have a fuel pump that pump fuel through this line and fill this bowl. So we'll take this part in a minute, but there's two floats in here. Their job is to shut that flow of fuel off once the bowl is full. So that float system works like the float valve in your toilet. You know, there's that big round ball in the tank. So when the water fills that tank, that ball floats up and it shuts the flow of water off. Same idea here. So if there's anything wrong with that valve, that gas will just keep flowing. And that might be one reason your sled is flooding. So we'll start by taking these four screws out and taking the float chamber off. Okay, so that's the bowl or the float chamber and that is the float. So there's one on each side. Now I've actually done an old Johnson outboard where these were cork, but they're usually gonna be plastic. Okay, so right here you have the float arm. That's what those floats press on when the bowl gets full of gas. And that presses on this mechanism right here. That's that little valve I was talking about. That's called the needle and seat. And that more often than not is the problem in a chronically flooding motor. So we want to remove the float arm, the needle and seat. To do that, we want something small enough and flat enough that we can push that pin out without spreading the end of it. 
So I have a really small Robertson screwdriver here. I'll just pull that pin out and pull the float arm out. So there is a really small retaining clip right there that holds that needle in. I'm gonna use a pair of needle nose pliers. You can actually do that with your fingers, but it's easy to drop it. So I found it easier to just grab it and pull it off. And then we can just carefully remove the needle. And I'm gonna use a nine millimeter socket to remove the rest of the assembly. So if you look through there, you can see that little hole. So that is where the fuel enters from your fuel pump. The other thing that's important, there's an O-ring right here on the threaded portion, and there's another O-ring underneath the baffle plate. So everything that's laid out here is intended to stop the flow of fuel when that float chamber is full. The O-rings here, they can get dried out and cracked and allow fuel to leak around them. The needle and seat, if it's really dirty, then that needle might not sit in there properly and not shut off the flow of fuel. This float arm, now it should be fine. There's nothing really in there to bend it, but if you bent it last time you cleaned your carburetor, if this tab gets bent or these arms get bent, then the floats might not push up properly on that needle. Most of the time, the problem is gonna be dirt keeping the needle and seat assembly from working properly. And a good carb cleaning is gonna solve your problem. But if you notice excessive wear or damage on any of those parts, you can buy a relatively inexpensive rebuild kit for most carburetors. Oh, and by the way, before I forget, if you are flooded, what do you do about it? Well, you gotta get all that extra fuel out of your cylinder. Well, how do you do that? You know, some guys are gonna tell you, just hold the throttle down and pull it over. Um, no. So even when it's not flooded, that 670 is a hell of a lot of work to pull over. I'm not gonna do it with my left hand while my right hand is on the throttle. In the interest of your safety and those around you, you don't wanna do any of the following steps. What you wanna do is take that flooded snowmobile to your nearest licensed snowmobile dealer. First thing you wanna do, turn your ignition off. Kill switch and key, you don't wanna ignite anything by mistake. Pull the spark plugs out, dry them off with a rag and put them aside. Then pull your engine over a few times to clear the excess gas out of there. Reinstall your spark plugs, put the wires back on, and you should be good to go. So I'm not recommending you do this because I don't want to assume any liability for that. Now, just remember, it's a very small amount of fuel and it's not compressed, so it's not tremendously likely to ignite. But obviously, anytime that you're spraying a fuel-air mixture around the outside of your snowmobile engine, there is some risk. Now, obviously, that's going to be a problem with a fuel-injected sled that's injecting fuel while you're trying to turn it over. So if you're not sure about your sled, check with the dealer. On this rev, if I hold the throttle to the bar when I turn it over, it doesn't inject any fuel. All right, guys, discussion time. So down in the comments, have you ever had a problem with an overly rich mixture or a chronically flooding snowmobile? Have you got a choke or a primer? What was causing the problem and how did you fix it? All right, so if you're flooding your sled all the time or if you're finding it's bogging down whenever you give it throttle, hopefully that gives you an idea what it might be. If you found that video interesting, helpful, or at least entertaining, do me a favor, click that thumbs up. And if you wanna learn more about disassembling, cleaning, and reassembling your carburetor, stick around and keep an eye on the channel. And with that, I'm gonna call it a wrap for another video. So until next time, I'm David Clark. Thanks for taking the time to watch. each and every day. The past is where it stays Way back a year ago I've changed for the better this time I thought I would never be fine I strive just to say I'm alright And for the first time in a long time I'm alright I've seen a lot of change been through a lot of pain Some things are not the same As they were a year ago But all will be okay I move on each and every day The past is where it stays Way back a year ago This 2005 MS <laughs> This one, like I said <clears throat> So I did go over, I did explain to him, it seemed like he was over priming this little boat. <laughs>